In this video, I'm going to cover an introduction to organic chemistry and the structure of alkanes. Organic chemistry is different than what we've been looking at for most of this year in general chemistry. Um, and organic chemistry deals specifically with compounds that contain carbon. So carbon is unique among the elements because it can make bonds to itself and to almost every other element. So most of the stuff that we've been looking at uh, this term um, specifically and throughout the year, uh, we've been looking at inorganic compounds, um, inorganic because they don't contain carbon. And some of the things we've seen are um, a, a, a central atom with atoms flanking it. So remember we looked at different geometries like linear and tetrahedral and um, when there are five coordinating atoms we call that trigonal bipyramidal, or with six here, this is called octahedral. So remember, octahedral was about as big as, as the compounds that we looked at, had six atoms flanking a central atom. So most inorganic compounds don't get a lot bigger than this. Um, when we started to look at coordination compounds, we saw that some of these ligands, uh, NH3, for example, has four atoms in itself. So when these four atom ligands are coordinating to a central atom in this hexagonal geometry, this compound is starting to get pretty big too as an inorganic compound. Um, but in general, compounds are fairly spherical, the inorganic ones, because they're usually groups, ligands, or something that are flanking a central atom. Um, and there's not a lot of chains of atoms that are stuck together to make the molecule get larger. And the reason is because uh, sulfur can't make another bond to sulfur and then another bond to sulfur and another bond and so on. Bonds, a bond between two sulfur atoms is generally stable, but a bond between uh, many sulfur atoms um, in a long chain uh, it becomes less stable. Um, sulfur actually is, is an atom that's fairly good at making bonds to itself. Uh, fluorine can make a bond to another fluorine atom in an F2 molecule, but I can't make several bonds to fluorine. Fluorine can't make a chain of atoms. Um, nitrogen can't make a chain of atoms. Oxygen can't make a chain of bonds where they're all bonded together, but carbon can. So here's car a carbon compound that has a carbon bonded to a carbon, bonded to a carbon, and so on and so on. And these bonds are very stable where carbon is bonded to itself again and again and again, and it can make very long molecules. Um, this specific molecule has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbon atoms, and the prefix for eight is oct, like an octagon. Um, so this compound right here is called octane. Uh, it has an, an alkane functional group. Alkane is because there's only carbon-carbon single bonds. And so the, the prefix oct stands for th that there's eight carbon atoms. And the suffix ane, -ain, tells me that all of those carbon atoms have single bonds between them. So this molecule, octane, refers to the chemical structure. And this is a molecule that's found in gasoline that you put uh, into your car to make your car move. This compound is called mitotoxin, and it's a substance that's produced by marine plankton, a poison. Um, this is, again, just a, a testament to how large organic compounds can be. This structure contains long chains of carbon. Um, carbon becomes an atom that is so frequent in organic molecules that it's often left out of the structure because we would just see C, 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 everywhere. And so you'll see that in these um, organic compounds, the carbons are conspicuously missing, even though the whole thing is, is mostly made of carbon. And that's because the carbons become these end, the bend, right? Here's a bend that's carbon. And here's an end. The end of the chain is a carbon atom. So this is a carbon. Here's the end of a chain. That's a carbon. Here's the end of a chain. That's a carbon. Here's the end. That's a carbon. So everywhere there's an end. It's not already labeled. This one's an oxygen. But this one's not labeled, therefore it's a carbon. Um, and the bend. So here the chain bends, that's a carbon. Here the chain bends, that's a carbon. Here the chain bends, that's a carbon. And so on. Carbon, 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 carbon. So most of the compound is made of carbon. Um, but because 
all organic compounds are made of carbon, we can kind of take that for granted and therefore leave the C's out. This is called a skeletal structure. This is called a space filling model because of course when we draw sticks in between letters, that's a pretty unrealistic version of, of what a real molecule looks like. Um, but it helps us understand what the molecule is made of. The letter stands for an element. We can look at the periodic table. The lines stand for bonds between those elements. This is a more realistic version of what a compound might look like, where there is no stick in between atoms. The atoms are represented as spheres, and the bond is the overlap between two spheres. And when two spheres overlap, that creates a bond. So all of these spheres that are overlapping are creating all of the bonds and the, the atoms of different color um, standing for the atoms of different elements. So in organic chemistry, since there are virtually an infinite number of unique organic compounds, molecules are grouped together based on patterns that are repeated in different molecules that are called functional groups. So because carbon can bond to itself, over and over and over again, and carbon can also bond to virtually all the other elements on the periodic table, there is near a nearly infinite number of ways that you can arrange those atoms in different ways to make different molecules. Um, and people make new molecules every day. Uh, as part of my doctoral dissertation when I was getting my PhD in chemistry, I made probably about 50 molecules that have probably never been made in the history of the earth and potentially the history of the universe unless there are conditions that we don't know about somewhere on a planet or unless there are other intelligent beings that are putting atoms together in arrangements that wouldn't be naturally found um, and so putting atoms together in ways that are different than they've ever been put together before is not particularly hard to do because there's so many different ways that it can be done so, since there are a virtually infinite number of unique compounds, we need a way to group them all together because understanding the properties of an infinite number of things would be impossible. But understanding the properties of, let's say, 20 categories of molecules is much easier because we can, if we can make 20 categories into which every single one of these virtually infinite number of molecules can fit into, then we really only have to memorize 20 different groups, not an infinite number of different groups. So, and that's generally the case. So, carbon-carbon um, single bonds, when molecules contain that, it doesn't matter what molecule the carbon-carbon single bond is in, a carbon-carbon single bond is going to behave pretty much the same way in any molecule that it's in. Therefore, when molecules contain a carbon-carbon single bond, we can call those molecules alkanes. That's the functional group. Carbon-carbon double bonds are called alkenes. Carbon-carbon triple bonds are called alkynes. A specific arrangement, in a, a circular arrangement of double bonds like this, we call aromatic. Um, we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit later on. Um, and so on and so on. There's lots of different groups. Alkyl halide, referring to the halogen, and alcohol has an OH on it, a thiol has an SH on it, an amine has an NH on it. So depending on what groups are bonded to the carbon, because they always have carbon, because we're always talking about organic compounds here. So depending on what groups there are bonded to the carbon, we can put that molecule into a different category called a functional group. Any molecule that contains a carbon bonded to an O, bonded to an H, in this pattern, any molecule that has that, we call it an alcohol. So this is a, uh, what we call a functional group that helps us put all molecules that have that pattern of atoms into the same category, and so on and so on. So we're going to look first at the hydrocarbons. And these are uh, molecules that are made of carbon and hydrogen only. And there's actually more than one functional group because there's different ways in which the carbon and hydrogen can be arranged, which give compounds different properties. So for example, carbon can be single bonded, carbon-carbon single bond. We call those alkanes. Or carbon-carbon double bond, we call those alkenes. And carbon-carbon triple bond, we call those alkynes. And again, we, this, this double bonded pattern in a ring, we call this aromatic. So the point is that propane is a compound that contains one, two, three carbons, and three plus three, six, plus two, eight hydrogens, so C3H8 is, prop is propane. 
and propane is different than propene, which has one, two, three carbons, and one, two, three, plus three, six hydrogens, so it has two fewer hydrogens, right? H8, H6. So propane uh, and propene have different physical properties. They have different boiling points, they have different melting points, they have different densities, they have different chemical properties. They react in different ways to different uh, reagents. And propyne, which also has one, two, three carbon atoms, except two of the carbon atoms are triple bonded, this reacts in a different way than the other two. So even though these compounds are all fairly similar, they all have one, two, three carbon atoms bonded in a chain. One, two, three in a chain. One, two, three in a chain. Because they have a different structure, single, double, triple bond, they have different properties and they have different names. Um, and aromatic also fits into this category of hydrocarbon because it's made of just carbon in the ring and hydrogen on the outside. Although as we'll see, uh, some aromatic groups are not do contain other atoms besides carbon. So there's carbon in there, but maybe a nitrogen atom here, or maybe an oxygen atom here. And those compounds are also considered aromatic. So it's not so much about the carbon, it's more about the bonding pattern. Double, single, double, single, double, single in a ring like this. Okay, so let's start with alkanes. So here's a couple of different alkanes. We have methane, which has one carbon, ethane, which has two carbons, and pentane, which has five carbons. So the prefixes, uh, we'll look at these in a bit, but there's um, meth stands for one carbon, eth stands for two carbons, pent stands for one, two, three, four, five, pent like a pentagon. So the first few prefixes do not match this kind of uh, Greek hexagon, octagon, pentagon kind of system that we're used to. Um, there's meth for one, eth for two, prope for three, and bute for four. Then we enter the, the realm that you might be familiar with. Pent meaning five, like a pentagon. Hex meaning six, like a hexagon. Hept meaning seven, uh, a heptagon. Um, eight is oct, like an octagon and so on and so on. So from that point forward, the prefixes refer to uh, that kind of Greek system of numbering. Methane, the simplest alkane, uh, potentially not even considered an alkane because it doesn't really contain a carbon-carbon single bond, but it does contain carbon-hydrogen single bonds like the other alkanes. Um, of course, when we're looking at bonds to hydrogen, they're always going to be single bonds because hydrogen always has one electron to donate and it only has room for one more in its valence shell because it only has that first valence shell, the 1s shell, which can only hold two electrons. So all bonds to hydrogen are going to be single bonds. So in methane, uh, it has a tetrahedral geometry. So um, remember, we looked at this before when there's four pairs of electrons, they're trying to get as far apart from each other as they possibly can. And that results in a structure that looks like this, where all of these bonds are equally distant from each other. This is as far apart as they can possibly spread. And that gives us 109.5 degrees. Um, and the bond angles in methane are all the same, which is 1.09 angstrom. Uh, and we looked a bit at hybridization before, where the s orbital and the 3p orbitals are hybridizing so that the carbon actually has um, rather than electrons in s orbitals and p orbitals, all of the valence electrons and carbon are in these sp3 hybridized orbitals, and that's really what gives rise to this tetrahedral arrangement, this tetrahedral shape. So uh, here is a um, just a, a, a basic structure, uh, maybe we call this the condensed structure of methane. Here's what we call a ball and stick representation. And this is a space-filling representation where, again, the, a stick for a bond is kind of unrealistic. It, it kind of shows that the atoms are separated, but we know the atoms are not separated. The atoms are right next to each other. So the space-filling representation kind of gives us a better picture of what the molecule really looks like. Um, here's ethane, which is an, an, the next alkane, which is a carbon bonded to a carbon. There's two carbons in this alkane. 
carbon-carbon single bond. The geometry is still the same. Um, because the carbon is a bit different than the hydrogen, then these uh, bond angles are going to be slightly different. Instead of being um, 109.5, it's 109.6. So the carbon kind of pushes down on these hydrogens a little bit. Um, but for the most part, the geometry is the same. It's still tetrahedral. They're still sp3 hybridized. Um, these bond angle, the carbon-carbon bond angle, is bigger than the carbon-hydrogen bond angle. And that's because carbon is using its uh, second valence shell. And so the, the bond between carbon and carbon, because the atomic radius is bigger in carbon, that bond length is also going to be longer. Um, so when we're looking at these three-dimensional representations, we have different kinds. We have that, that condensed structure, right, the simplest one. We have a ball and stick, which kind of shows a little bit more three-dimensionality. And then the space-filling model to show us um, that the, the atoms are not separated and they're not really like sticks. They're really the, the valence orbitals overlap, and that's what gives rise to those bonds. Um, and so in the same way, there's, we have multiple representations of molecules when we're drawing them in a book. Um, and so you might see a, a representation like this that we call the expanded formula, where every single bond is explicitly drawn. All the bonds between carbon are explicitly drawn, and all the bonds between hydrogen are explicitly drawn. Now some of these bonds are longer than others, but that's not to indicate that they're really longer than others in the molecule. This carbon bond is the same length as all the other carbon-carbon bonds, or at least a similar length. It fits into a regime of, of lengths between carbon bonds. They might be slightly different because they're in different places in the molecule, but they're not twice as long as this might indicate. That's just to, to give us room to write these H's up here above the others. That's why these are longer than the others. Um, <clears throat> so if we wanted to conserve space and draw the H's uh, and not explicitly draw all the H's, all those bonds, we could do something like this. Instead of drawing C with three H's bonded to it, we could shorthand that and write CH3. And this one, C with three H's bonded to it, we could shorthand that to CH3 and so on. Here's a C with one H bonded to it. All the other atoms are carbon. So this one H, we would say that's CH and so on. So this kind of representation is called a condensed formula. We took the expanded formula and we condensed it. And finally, this is the, the, the most condensed of all, where this structure here, the skeletal structure, the atoms themselves, the letters themselves have disappeared. So this is what most organic structures are, are represented using skeletal structures. Because as you saw, some molecules can get very large and organic chemists are lazy. And we don't want to write C and H over and over and over again. And if we can design a simple system so that a series of zigzag lines means the same thing as this, then in the same way that this is obviously an easier way to draw it than this is, well, then we can say this is an even easier way to draw it than this is. So the skeletal structure, let's see how we can turn this into this. So the first thing to consider is that when we look at a skeletal structure, all the bends and the ends are carbon atoms. So what I mean by that is that the end of each chain is a carbon atom. So let's do the ends. That's easy. Here's an end, carbon. Here's an end, carbon. Here's an end, carbon. Here's an end, carbon. And now all the bends. So anywhere that the, uh, the, the zigzag chain, and we can say that there's several chains here that we might be able to see, but wherever the chain changes direction, we would call that a bend. So there's a bend, and there's a bend. So I know that in this formula, let me write it down here, C6. I have six carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six carbons. All the bends and ends are carbon atoms. All right. Now, each carbon atom must make four bonds, no more, no less. So if I look at what's drawn here, I can see that this carbon atom has one bond. This carbon atom has one, two, three bonds. This carbon atom has one. This carbon atom has three, two, three. This carbon atom, one. 
this carbon atom one, right? So I can count the number of bonds there. So each carbon atom must make four, no more, no less. Right now, none of these atoms are making four bonds. So what do we do? We add hydrogen atoms to each carbon until each carbon has four bonds. All right, easy enough. So if I have one carbon right here, and I would make three more bonds to H, H, H. Now this carbon has one, two, three, four bonds. And the reason that carbon atoms all have to make four bonds is because of the octet rule. Two, four, six, eight electrons. So this carbon right here has one, two, three bonds. So here, I'm going to change the color of these, actually. So if it has three bonds, then I'll draw one bond to H. All right, so one, two, three bonds to, uh, to H from this carbon makes four total bonds. Here I have one, two, three, four bonds now. This carbon has four bonds with one of those being a bond to H. This carbon has one, two, three. It needs one more. H. Now this bond, now this carbon has four. One, two, three, four. This carbon has one bond, so it needs three H's. H, H, H. And this one needs three H's. H, H, H. And this one needs three H's. And right, now I have one, two, three, four. 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 All right, every carbon atom has four bonds. So this is the expanded structure, right, where all of the bonds to hydrogen are explicitly drawn. So if we want to convert this to a skeletal structure, or excuse me, the condensed structure, then I'm going to erase the carbon hydrogen bonds. Make it a little bit simpler, right? I'll erase that, erase the bonds to H now. And now I can write C H three C H C H C H three. C H three C H three. So the way to interpret this, oh and let's finish our how many H's we have over here. Let's count them up. Three, six, nine, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. H fourteen. So this and this are the same, right? So I can go backwards and turn this into this. All I have to do is make the C's and the H's disappear. And so to make the C's and the H's disappear, let's go like this, right? And then connect these. Connect these with lines, like this. All right, so then all the C's and H's disappeared, and we're left back with the skeletal structure that we started with here. C6, H14. All right, how to convert a chemical formula to a skeletal structure. So what if I have this, and I want to turn it into a structure? They give me some kind of one-dimensional formula in a book, and I'm trying to turn this into a structure. So let's draw the carbon chain first, ignoring hydrogen atoms. So I have a C bonded to a C, but then this group is in parentheses, and there's a 2 on the outside. So what's a CH2, and how is there two of them? So probably uh, 
a good place to start is to do this as a two-step process. So the first step will be drawing this as an expanded formula. So I have C, H3, H, 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 and that's bonded to the next one, CH2, C, H2, and that leaves one more bond open, right, because this carbon can have four, and after it's bonded to the one before it, and it has CH2, there's one, two, three bonds taken up, so this carbon can bond to one more group. Now what's it bonded to? Well, there's two of these CH2s in a row. It says CH2, 2. There's two of them. So the next CH2 comes next like this. And so you can see now this one, the fourth bond, was the bond of the next CH2. Now I have this one has one, two, three bonds, and it can be bonded to one more thing. What's this, this second CH2 bonded to? It's bonded to C. A big surprise. C. All right, so C is then uh, bonded to C H three. So there, this C is bonded to C, and there's three of them. So if we put a C here and three H's on it, I'm going to draw them really small here. H, H, H. Then that carbon is done. Right, so it can't. It has one, two, three, four bonds on it. It's done. It can't have anything else. All of these carbons that came before, they're done too. So I know I said ignoring hydrogen atoms, but in order to uh, show how what C, in order to interpret CH two, I wanted to draw the hydrogen atoms first, so we can see what a CH two was and how it was stuck to another CH two and so on. But I do think it's a good idea to try to draw this first draw the chain first, like I said, without the hydrogens. There, I'll just start from the beginning, now that we know what a CH2 is. And the way that we would do that is by showing C is bonded to what? The well, it's obviously bonded to the next atom in the, in the row, but the next atom in the chain can't be an H. H can never connect two atoms in a chain. It always hangs off the end. So if C, if H can't continue the chain, then what continues the chain? The next C. So I have C bonded to C, and then how many C's are here? There's two of them. The next one is that next CH2, and then that's bonded to another C, and then that's bonded to another C, and then there's nothing after that. We're at the end, right? So some of it's CH3, these can't be in a chain because if I have a CH3 bonded to a CH3, it can't be bonded to another CH3. There's, n there's no room for anything before this molecule because there's one, two, three, four on this carbon. And there's no room for anything after because there's one, two, three, four on this carbon. So two CH3s can be bonded to each other, but that's it. There can't be anything on this side, and there can't be anything on this side. And we call this molecule is called ethane. And so CH3s can't be used in a chain, but CH2s can. And because if I take this off and turn a CH3 into a CH2, now look, now there's room for something over here, and there's room for something over here. So CH2s can be used to make a chain longer, but CH3s can't. They must go at the end. So these, so a CH3 there at the end. Now, where the other CH3s come in, well, let's add branches to the chain. So this one, let's put numbers here. Oops. C1, C2, and three, C four. One of these is C five. One, but there's total one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons. So the other two add branches. Where are these other two carbons? Well, they must be here and here, like this. So let's go back and add the hydrogens, and I think it'll make more sense at that point. 
So now we have CH3, so we can add these CH3 here. And then we have two CH2s. And then we have a C done. And we have three CH3s. So this C is done. And it's done because it's connected to three C's, and they are CH3s, which must sit at the end, right? Nothing can be connected to a CH3 group. It can't, use to ex can't be used to extend the chain. So the CH3 groups sit at the end here. There's kind of like big hydrogen atoms, right? There's a small hydrogen atom. It's at the end. It can't connect to anything. There's kind of like a big hydrogen atom. It's at the end. It can't connect to anything. So interpreting how these atoms are connected in a chemical formula is just reading them from left to right and kind of drawing the backbone. Because when you get to a situation like this where, oh, well, all three of these can't be part of the chain, well, when you draw the backbone, you see, well, where do the other ones go? Well, this carbon here has some opening, has some bonds that were open. It had two bonds that were open. So one of the CH3s could go up here, and one of the CH3s could go down here. All right, now how do we turn this into a skeletal structure? All right, so I have in my longest chain, I have one, two, three, four, five. So I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five. And now on carbon four, I have two methyl groups. So one, two, three, four. Here's carbon four. I have two CH3s. So I can draw one up here like this, and one down here like this. Right? And now this is a skeletal structure that is the same as this, and this expanded structure is the same as this. All right, so here are the names and some properties of the simplest alkanes. So alkanes and all functional groups are uh, um, grouped based on the number of carbon atoms. So with one carbon, it's called methane. Two carbons is ethane. Three carbons is propane. Four, butane. Five, pent. Six, hex. Seven, hept. Eight, oct. Nine is non, nonane. 10 is dec, decane, um, and then 14 and 18, and it goes on and on and on. And they can get really, really big, right? So they're, most of these small ones are gases. They can become liquids as they get bigger, right? Octane is part of gasoline. It's a liquid. And as they get even bigger and bigger and bigger, they can become solids. Uh, they become kind of like waxes. So let's figure out how to name these, where the naming rules come from. So the first rule is that we have to find the longest continuous chain of carbon atoms, and that longest chain is going to become the parent of the whole compound. So if there is only a chain, then the name of the compound is this, right? A chain of seven carbon atoms is called heptane. A chain of eight carbon atoms is called octane, and so on. So these are the names of these chains that have this many carbon atoms in a row. So once we find the longest continuous chain, that molecule is going to be based, the name of that molecule is based on that parent compound, the longest chain. Um, if there are branches, though, then it's not just octane. We have to say, oh, it's 2-chlorooctane. There's a chlorine atom on there, and it's on carbon 2. Or there's a methyl group on carbon 4. Or there's something else, right? It's not just octane. If it's just the chain, then that's easy. But generally, there's going to be branches on the chain that we also have to name. So rule one, find the longest chain and name it um, according to the table we just looked at. Um, number two, we have to number the longest chain. So if there's eight carbon atoms in a row, I can number it from left to right. But I can also number it from right to left. Um, and the way that I number the longest chain, do I go from left to right or right to left, has to do with the branches and what the branches are on that compound and where the branches are. So um, we begin with the end of the chain that's nearest a substituent, which is just a branch, an atom, a branch that's on that longest chain. 
So we'll learn the rule for numbering the longest chain after we found it. And finally, we name the branches, name the groups that are attached to the longest chain. Um, we have to also number them because we can't just say there's a methyl group there. We have to say the methyl is attached to carbon three, the methyl is attached to carbon four. Um, and after we've named the branches, and if there are multiple branches, we put the branches in alphabetical order, and then we, we end with the uh, parent name of the branch. So I know it's a lot of information. Let's look at an example here. So um, the longest chain of consecutive carbons here is um, one, two, three, four. Or if I look at this one, it's one, two, three, four, or this one, one, two, three, four, right? So we look for the longest chain of carbons in the molecule that we're looking at, and we try to number it and see what the longest chain is. So in all of these cases, the longest chain is four. So we go back to our table, and when I have four carbons in a row, that's called butane. So all of these images are actually the same compound. They're just drawn differently, right? These are all different representations of the same compound butane. Rule two, we would number the longest chain beginning at the end of the chain nearest a substituent. So for example, in uh, these, this image here, I can, I found the longest chain. It goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now look, there's lots of other carbons. Let's, let's see, make sure that's the longest chain. I could go start here and I'd go one, two, three, four. That's only a chain of four before it stops. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's pretty long, but that's only a chain of six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So this doesn't seem like the right place to start. If I start up here, I can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I that's a chain of seven, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there's lots of different sevens here, one, two, three, four, five, and then it stops. So no matter which way I try to number this, um, seven seems to be the longest chain. So when I'm, when, once I've found the longest chain, there are different sevens, right? I had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven here, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven here. So the way that we determine which of those is correct is by trying to maximize the number of branches onto the longest chain. So if I do it the way that is shown here, I get one, two branches. If I go five, six, seven, this and this become a branch. But if I go five, six, seven, then I only have one branch there. This whole piece would become the branch on carbon five. So because I get more branches by numbering it this way, the correct way is to number it the way with more branches. All right, and now, that I've found the right chain, the longest chain. Do I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, from the bottom to the top? So in order to number the chain correctly, we have to uh, number it, we have to give each branch the smallest numbers. So let's see what numbers I'm gonna have here. Right here I have um, a branch at three. Let's keep track of this, three. I have a branch at four. Four, I have a branch at five, five, and I have a branch at six, six. So at three, four, five, and six, I'll have branches if I number it from top to bottom. But if I take that same chain and I number it from the bottom to the top, then I have a branch at two, I have a branch at three, I have a branch at four, and I have a branch at five, right? There's no branches at six and no branches at seven. So my choices are, I either have branches at three, four, five, and six, if I do it from the top to the bottom, or I have branches at two, three, four, and five, if I do it from the bottom to the top. So I always want my branches to have the lowest numbers possible. So doing numbering the chain from the bottom to the top gives me numbers that are smaller than if I numbered it from the top to the bottom. So this is the wrong way to number it, and this is the right way to number it. So then I have to go and name 
these branches and put the whole thing together. So let's not worry about the name quite yet. Let's go and put all the other pieces together first. Okay, so the last rule is naming the alkyl groups. So um, we looked at the table that tells me what the name of the molecule is that has um, one carbon and two carbons and three carbons and so on. Methane, ethane, propane, butane, and pentane. If these are groups on a molecule, so a branch, we'll call these alkyl groups. I think it's easier to, to think of them as branches on the chain. So if, if this is just the molecule by itself, I'd call it methane and it would have four hydrogens. But if this is a branch hanging off of a larger chain, then it would only have three hydrogens because it needs to have a way to bond to the chain. And I would, it would be a CH3 group, like those ones that we drew on that molecule, and I would call it a methyl group. So the, the parent compound, methane, we drop the A-N-E ending and we add plus Y. L. So methane becomes methyl, ethane, ethyl, propane, propyl, and so on. So, and what I mean by this is if I have a molecule here, then if I have a CH3 group as a branch on this chain, then that's going to be called a methyl group. If it is a CH3 to CH3, then that is called an ethyl group. If it is CH2, CH2, CH3, of course at that point it would be bonded way over here, right? So if, if my branch had one, two, three carbons, CH2, CH2, CH3, then it would be called a propyl group. Now of course if I were to erase this whole molecule, I look at my propyl group, which is just a branch on this long chain. It's just a branch that has three. If I were to erase the long chain, and instead of being attached to the chain, this was attached to another hydrogen, CH3, then this molecule is called propane, right? But if I erase the CH3 and turn it into a CH2, then I have room for a bond to join that group to a chain. All right, so let's go back and look at this one again. So when I number my compound this way, oh, no, this is the correct way. When I number my compound this way, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, from the bottom to the top, then I see that these groups that are not part of the chain, they're branches. And so the branches, um, I have to see what they consist of. This branch has one carbon, so it's called a methyl branch. This branch has one, two carbon, so it's called an ethyl branch, comes from ethane. Here's another branch with one carbon, another branch with one carbon. So this compound has one, two, three methyl groups, three branches that are CH3 branches hanging off the end. This is not a CH3 branch hanging off the end because this is part of the chain. This is not a CH3 branch because this is part of the chain. But all the other CH3s are part of branches, even this one, because it's part of a bigger branch that we call ethyl. So three methyls and one ethyl. This methyl is at carbon two. This methyl is at carbon four. This methyl is at carbon five. This ethyl is at carbon three. So when I'm putting this together and I'm trying to put the whole name together, I know that this is a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The chain has seven carbons in it. So if I look at my table, C7 is heptane. So this, the compound, I have to name the branches too, but once I name the branches, it's going to be some variety of heptane because it has seven carbons in a chain. Seven carbons in a chain is heptane. Here's seven carbons in a chain. This is some variety of heptane. It's not pure heptane because it has all these branches. It has extra stuff on it. So let's name the extra stuff. Well, I have two methyl, four methyl, and five methyl. Two four, and five. And if I have three of them, then I really have tri-methyl. Um, and I have an ethyl at carbon three. Th 
three ethyl. So how do I stick all of these pieces together to make a name? Well, I have to alphabetize the branches. If I have methyl branches and ethyl branches, which one comes first? Well, the one that has the lowest alphabetical letter that starts with the, um, the lowest letter alphabetically. So E comes before M. So ethyl comes before methyl. So when I stick all these together, I'm going to put 3 ethyl, 2, 4, 5 trimethyl heptane. And we put all of the branches together and the chain together in the alphabetical order to get the correct name for the molecule.